you just point the camera my direction, and we'll figure it out together. It always sounds so simple and yet so moronic. Hello and welcome to episode 114 of Popcorn and Prosecco, a show that's all about talking about movies. I am Perry Nemroff, and here are my co-hosts, Christy Puchko and Angie Han. Hello. Hey, everybody. All right, so we got two movies for you this week. Our hot topic is going to be a brief review of the movie Love and Friendship, and then we're going to jump into our main review, which is Money Monster. So first up, Love and Friendship. Angie, you got it. All right, so here is the synopsis. Lady Susan Vernon takes up temporary residence at her in-laws' estate, and while there, is determined to be a matchmaker for her daughter Frederica and herself, too, naturally. So this is a new film by uh, Witt Stillman. It's based on a novella by Jane Austen. and if Oh, anything, shit, it's a period piece with big hats and frilly dresses, isn't it? Yeah. No? Yes. Okay, yes. I'm glad I didn't see it. <laughs> Yeah, I actually, as soon as I was done with it, I texted Aunt pa- pa- Angie and was like, Perry'd hate this. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like a period drama. It's a comedy. It's just that they're all in frilly dresses. But yes, it is definitely a period piece. And if you know anything about Whit Stillman and Jane Austen, like, they kind of, like, it, it it's str- crazy to me that he hasn't adapted a Jane Austen novel before. Yeah, because he makes preppy really people movies, and she was all about the posh yeah. So I caught this one at Sundance earlier this year, and I it like to me it was like laugh out loud hilarious. The way I kept describing it to people is like you think when you hear all those names like it's gonna be like New Yorker cartoon funny where you're like oh ho 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 what a dry wit you know. But I actually like found myself like gasping for laughter. There's one character in particular played by oh I can't remember his name Tom Bennett right? Is that his name? I think. Yes. Anyway, so there's one character in particular who comes on and he's just this idiot and it's just. <laughs> He's divinely stupid. And what's great about it is he's that kind of stupid where he has no, like, he's totally oblivious to the fact that people around him think he's an idiot, but he's not, he's not a jerk. So it's kind of wonderful to watch him just blather on utter nonsense. And like, I mean, him talking about like agricultural standards or something sounds really insipid, but it was really, really funny. Like I was bummed every time he wasn't around. Yeah. And the thing that the movie does really well is that like, it just, the whole movie kind of has this tone of like, I feel like from the beginning, you know, that it's going to be funny because one of the things it does is that like every time it introduces a new character, it shows you like, it it just like trains the camera on the person just like kind of standing there. And uh, I know that sounds kind of weird, but you pick up so much about, like, who these people are from the way that they're, like, standing at the camera or looking at it or, like, how they're interacting with it. And they're all very, like, kind of weird and funny. And one thing that the – one of the reasons that this guy is so funny in this movie is because – yeah, and, like, he comes on, and every time you think, like, okay, this is getting dumber and dumber, and surely this scene is going to end. It just keeps going. But uh, really the star of the movie is uh, Kate Beckinsale, who – this this has to be her best – role in years like she's fantastic in this you know what's funny is i was looking up the imdb just now for it and it's got kate beckinsale and chloe savigny in it and we're doing on new york one this week the the last days of disco so i was looking up that and they're in that together so yeah. maybe i should make it a whole weekend of the two of them this yeah, is no, really it- funny in this kate beckinsale plays the main character who is kind of um very dedicated she's very opportunistic and very dedicated to getting herself and her daughter hitched above all things so she's very duplicitous um but in a weirdly charming way yeah well, and then chloe so- savenier is her like crude american friend who's not at all crude she's just an american but you know how that goes they have a lot of jokes about how she's just like uh, like like her i forget what i forget her, her husband who was played by stephen fry her husband keeps to- threatening to send her back to like wisconsin no, it's Connecticut. Connecticut. It's not even Wisconsin. She's just like, she like her Kate Beckinsale's like, what is he going to do? And she's like, oh, the worst thing imaginable. He's going to send me back to Connecticut. So there are a lot of jokes and they're like, like oh, that. How, oh, how do you say her last name? Chloe Savigny. Uh, I don't know. Okay. I, I figured I would use popcorn and Prosecco to clear that up before I go on air and say it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trusting you. One of the things that I found so winning about this a bad is, idea. Like Kate Beckinsale is a portrait of this like she's she's unapologetic about how duplicitous and manipulative and like ambitious she is. And I feel like what's actually pretty rare to see a movie about female ambition where it's not really vilified or where it's like not like like this isn't one of those movies where like, oh, you know, she she got what you wanted, but like at what cost? Like it's not really like that. It like she so that was one of the things that I thought was kind of unusual and exciting and funny about it. Is it fast? What's the pace like? I think um, it's pretty I mean, short. It's, a, it's like an Austin movie. So it's actually, I would say it's fast paced for an Austin movie because I think it's only 87 minutes. Yeah. yeah. And short. like there's a lot fewer characters than like Sense and Sensibility or Pride and Prejudice because it's based on a short story. So it's not like you need to know quite as many people 
as as you typically do. Um, but I, I actually I agree with Angie about the vilification of the character um, because she is a very she's a social climber, like an outright social climber. But the film takes into context how few options she has. Like she's a woman. She's not really allowed to work. And if she was able to work, then that would actually ruin her daughter's prospects because her daughter would be considered low class. And like so her option is to marry well and. Her working that out is awesome. There's one point where she tries to marry her daughter off to someone her daughter is not at all interested in. And she basically, her daughter says something like, I could stand being in a room with him. I can't imagine marrying him. And she's like, and marriage is for your whole life. And Kate Beckinsale goes, well, not in my experience. Right. Because she's, she's a like widow. a widow at 35 or something. And it's just like, I love the idea of banking on, like, if we marry you to an older man, he'll die eventually. <laughs> Like, yeah, I mean that's one of the that's one of the things that I think that you know it's a concern of Austin's and like all of her novels is the way that like these things seem really frivolous, especially like now where you think about like oh it's just like people gossiping and backstabbing and stealing each other's boyfriends and whatever. But one of the things that I thought this movie did really well is drive the point home that this is how she gets ahead. She has no other options for getting ahead, and so this is like really what you're watching is a woman being like fucking good at her job. Yeah, yeah, she is a uh, boss at yeah. marrying people. Yes, but also um, it's but yeah. very, very funny, and I feel like people should watch it, so run out and see it. Yeah, I agree. I think if you like Austin's sense of humor, this is a very Austin movie, and it's kind of cool because since it's not very much about romance, it's a very different sort of Austin. Yeah, it's not Like, it's about romantic. marriage, but not romance. It, it emphasizes the comedy a lot more than romance. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, you know, boyfriends and husbands and, like, mistresses and whatnot, but actually not very much, like, bosom-heaving romance. Or any. Yeah, there's not a lot of falling in love. Just a lot of falling in and out of bed. Just there is some tricking men into falling in love with you, but yeah. That's true. That's true. Oh, Fair. Okay. You guys have made me kind of curious, which is saying a lot for me. It's very short and it's gonna be on Amazon Prime probably not too long from now, so yeah, could be a good thing yeah, to it's charming. on. It's a good okay. rainy day movie, totally. All right, I'll take it. All right, let's move on to our next review. This is our big review of the week. It's of Money Monster. And here is the IMDb synopsis for that one. Financial TV host Lee Gates and his producer Patty are put in an extreme situation when an irate investor takes over their studio. Yep, that's pretty accurate. Um, I I already see these two making faces. I kind of liked this well, movie. Irate investor, gun-toting terrorist. But go on. All right, fine. If you look at this movie as if you don't basically don't look too deep into this movie because it's a really silly, silly plot. I mean, George Clooney's character, he plays the TV host Lee Gates. He is so insanely over the top. It is so ridiculous. There's no way a guy like that would ever have a popular show. It's the dumbest thing I've ever uh, seen. Have you seen like Jim Cramer? That's like who it's no. based on. Oh, really? It's really based on a real show. Oh, that's... Uh, you know the show Mad Money? That's like the most awful thing I've ever seen. It was making me cringe every time he did a little dance. Yeah. Okay, well, anyway... They made, like, George Clooney painfully unhip. Okay, well, I'm not going to watch that show anymore, so... No. <laughs> if you look at this movie, like, for some reason I kept comparing it to The Call while I was watching it, where it's... The Halle it's just, Berry movie? Yeah, where it's just kind of this silly, you know, thriller, how's it going to end type situation. If you just kind of like sit back, relax, and take it for what it is, it is kind of fun to see where it's going to go. But yes, this movie should have come out three, four years ago. It feels really dated. Some of the plot points are really contrived. You could probably predict what's going to happen every step of the way. But if you just sit back and relax and enjoy it, I had a lot of fun with it. I mean, one of the things like... Speaking of being able to predict what's going to happen, this isn't necessarily, this isn't Jodie Foster's fault or anything like that, but the trailers give away, like, literally the entire plot. There are scenes in the trailer from, like, the third act, and, like, not that, not that, like, that, like, you know, I can, I can know how a movie's going to end and still enjoy it, but, it, so that wasn't, like, my biggest problem with it, but it does kind it did kind of, it didn't help. I didn't find the movie boring, like, I was, like, kind of amused and curious about what was going to happen throughout. But one of the things that, like, I walked out feeling kind of puzzled by was, like, it's a movie about a hostage a hostage situation that lacks in any tension at all. Like, at no point did I feel, like, tense or worried. Like, every once in a while, you know, someone will throw a punch and you just kind of, like, jump. But that was about it. Like, it is bizarre to me that I could watch a movie about America's sweethearts, George Clooney and Julia Roberts being taken hostage and just like not really worry about them at all. Well, yeah, I think that's probably thought... the reason I had fun with it. It's, it's almost like the disaster movie effect where it's these terrible things happening to innocent people. But for some reason, it's just the thrill of seeing, you know, citywide destruction on the big screen. It's, a, it's like, got that is... same effect on me. 
when I heard about the premise, which is that a guy who got burned by the show's financial advice comes to wreak revenge, I thought that sounded like an interesting situation where you'd be stuck in this claustrophobic moment where they're in a studio and no one can leave because there's an armed gunman. And I thought that was interesting when we initially heard about it. But uh, Foster keeps taking us out of that setting immediately. Like we're two minutes into the movie and she's already jumping to like South Africa and Reykjavik and stuff. And, and why we're jumping to those places isn't clear for like another hour. So setting it up that early just feels confusing. And then later you're like, well, this isn't a surprise because you set it up an hour ago. And so I was really disappointed in the lack of tension in the movie. But then on top of that, I was really bothered by the fact that I didn't really care about most of the characters because like you're supposed to eventually understand the Jack O'Connell character who plays the gun toting, you know, uneducated guy who has the worst Brooklyn accent ever. <laughs> and, uh, but like, God, that I, I, you're supposed to feel for him, but I just got really frustrated because it's like, what happened to him is terrible. It's terrible. That he lost all this money, but also, you know, we live in a situation now where people are mar- murdered on live television. So it really sh- like, they fail in making me empathetic for that character. It's it's just, I, I couldn't feel the escapist element of it enough. And then I, it didn't feel authentic enough. Like it's set in New York and the third act becomes very important that it's set, quote unquote, in New York. But no one behaves like you would behave in New York. And it drove me crazy oh, on that yeah, end. Yeah, that, that did drive me a little nutty. I mean, it is, how, how, what is the spoiler in the third act? Uh, I'm Which afraid. One? I'm afraid to say it, but there's some sort of well, behavior. Well, like we know from the trailer, they get out of of okay. the studio and they're like walking down the street, and there's okay. like all these New Yorkers gathered around. They're, I'm like, that would never happen. The police would have shut that whole area down. That's my that big ha- problem like, because not only would the police have shut that area down, but the first instinct that New Yorkers would have if something like that happened and they could get in that area would be to go the other way. And not just the other way, to go across the bridge and to get out of Manhattan. Nobody ever would have gotten that close ever. Yeah. It would have been yeah, just like, by, like this whole time, everyone, you know, like the whole thing, the whole reason that everyone is freaking out is because they have strapped a bomb onto George Clooney and like New Yorkers have some experience with horrible things happening involving bombs and it, their fair. Yeah. City, and our so. response is not let's all flock to where the police are saying don't go. Like, yeah. I, and I understand that it's like to be like, but that's not how New York is. And like. It's, but this is not like the qualm of like, to, to point out something Angie pointed out, it's not like whenever they create a subway stop because it's more convenient for the plot if there's just a subway stop at this area or whatever. Like, that's annoying as a New Yorker, but whatever. But this is like, if the city is supposed to be a character, as is very important in the end, then be authentic to what that experience is. And like, this just feels like Jodie Foster hasn't been to New York since like the 80s. It's well, also it's not just the fact that that isn't in line with how New Yorkers behave. That's not in line with how normal people would behave. I mean, you do that in any well, city. A- I, gar- uh, I guarantee you no one's coming over to that area. Well, there's a weird undercurrent of, of misanthropy in this movie that thinks the worst of people in a lot of scenarios where, you know, it's like you see that this guy is being held hostage and they cut to like some web series and people are like, oh my God, let's make fun of this. And it's like, maybe someone, like, I'm sure there are people out on the internet that would do that, but to present that as internet culture's response to such things is really disingenuous and shitty because, no, you know, we all work true. on the internet all day and that's not how the internet well, reacts was, when something it like was this just happens. A, it was a cartoonish version of of what they were trying to address. And really every single person in this movie was a villain in a way. Like nobody was kind of pure and easy to get behind. Someone did something wrong every step of the way in this movie. And I'll agree with you with the with the whole jet setting element of it too. That whole part of it felt like an afterthought. And I think someone had told me after that I saw the movie that that whole last little bit was kind of a reshoot type situation. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with reshoots. Like, sometimes movies sure. need them. But in, in this instance, I think I could feel that, that that was an afterthought. Feeling tacked on. Yeah. And really, the whole thing, basically anything that doesn't take place in New York feels like it almost came out of a different movie. Totally. Well, and, like, it feels like, like a shallow victory. And I don't want to get into specifically why, because that's big spoilers. But, like, the big moment where, like, the music surges and you're supposed to be like, he won! I was like, no, this is not, no one won. This yeah. is a horrible day for shit tons of people. This is the worst. No one, no one won. But the reason that I walked out of that movie with like a little extra pep in my step was because of a certain video that they played at the end. The Vine thing? I, yeah. 
I thought I mean, that, okay, that, I thought that was the only part of the movie where I was like, this is how realistic, I, like, I, realistically yeah, people that would was react. Accurate. The that most was realistic thing happened. and the thing that made me laugh out loud. And I walked out with a big smile on my face pretty much just for that 30 seconds. So you watched two hours of a movie that you didn't think was that good. And then they put in like a 30 second Vine clip at the end and you were like, no, I'm on board with this movie. I was there a little, higher standards. I was a little more on board than I would have been. <laughs> But backtracking, I still did enjoy sitting back and watching this movie. I think this is the perfect rainy day movie. I don't think it's boring, so I'm not like, oh my god, like, you know, no one should watch this or anything. Like, it's it's not, like, the worst thing I've ever seen. But, like, one of the things that I really didn't like about it was, um, 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 he's not so much a character as just, like, a symbol, a symbol of, like, you know, the good old, like, working class white Americans who, like, lost stuff and, like, you're just... And, like, Jack O'Connell plays him like a symbol because, like, I don't feel like I don't feel like the script gives him that much depth or, like, that much to him. He's just going no. to stand for stuff. And, like, so much of his performance consists of just, like, holding a gun and, like, screaming at people. And it, it's, I can't it seems like such a waste because, because we I've learned. seen Jack O'Connell do, like, really good work in other things. And I just don't – I feel like this is such a flimsy, thin role that, like, I completely see why he signed up for it. But I feel like the reason that he does so much emoting and, like, New York accent is because he has so little, like, of substance to – do here which is so surprising. there's, all, like, yeah. how do there's you also something Jack that O'Connell? happens in the middle of the movie that completely derails his character yeah how do you yeah. like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna spoil that but the the reaction that that scene had in my theater was just like half of the people were like oh and the other people were like hysterically laughing how do yeah, you at, our theater at, laugh at, at him George clooney julia roberts and jack o'connell in a movie and give them that little to do like that seems like yeah kind of weird i mean Based on when we heard about the premise, I thought based on that casting, it was going to be George Clooney and Jack O'Connell hammering out their differences and ideals like in front of the camera. But basically, it's like immediately he's like, I didn't do anything wrong. And he's like, yes, you did. And then they show the tape and he's like, oh, I guess I did do something wrong. But you should have understood that I was being hyperbolic. And he's like, why would I assume that? And then they just continue to yell at each other. And then he's like, it's not my fault. And it's like, there's no there's no real arc there. But then all of a sudden it just flips over and he's like, oh, now we're friends. And I'm like, I don't buy this at all. Like there was no, there's so little focus on what you think is going to be the main connection in the film that I was really disappointed. It also doesn't help that the movie is insanely uneven. Like you go, you go in with certain expectations. Like you were expecting that from this movie. Yes, I was fine with the fact that it was kind of a dumbed down version of what I thought it was going to be, like a sit back and relax kind of situation. But the thing I did have a hard time wrapping my head around is whether or not the this boner was tri- jokes. Wait, what? The boner, cream the boner stuff. jokes. Oh no. Well, there's like a whole like recurring. Not just that though, but like one minute I couldn't, and it might have been the effect of the people that I had seen it with, because I could never tell when people were laughing because something was funny, or they were laughing at what was happening in the movie, and just mm-hmm. the tone of this movie is all over the place. One minute I think that Jodie Foster expected you to fear for their lives, and then the next she was kind of making light of the situation, and. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint exactly how that made me feel because every so often I'm like, oh, this gives the movie like a unique energy. I'm okay with this. But then a couple minutes later, I'm like, you just stop short of making me care about one or the other. Yeah. There was actually only one character in this movie I really cared about, and it was Lenny the camera guy. Because like Lenny, <laughs> like everybody else, like-, like a real American, that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Lenny, whose name is Lenny Venito, and he was on a show called The Neighbors that got canceled that was way better and didn't deserve to get canceled. That's a whole other story. But Lenny, he's like a camera guy at the studio, and there's he has a chance to run away, and he doesn't. He sticks with them. And it was like, that made him an interesting character to me. And it's like, but he's literally like, he maybe has like maybe seven minutes of screen time, but it was like, he was a character I was actually engaged with. That's what I'm saying. And just giving me a look like I'm out of my mind, but that's what I'm saying. I have all these other characters we spend all this time with. And the one I was most engaged with was like, you know, the schlub camera guy that goes balls. Well, the thing I disagree that was the guy that, like, you know, I mean, he does give a pretty interesting performance with like how little screen time he has. But like the other thing is like, I feel like the movie also just treats him like a symbol. I think that's kind of what it drove me nuts about this movie and made it so hard to care is that every single character in this just is a, is a person that stands for something none of them feel like real yeah. characters with like real lives or real personalities or like really anything to them that we need to care about and lenny I you think, know is another example like he seemed like he was just there to be like he represents like the real america like the good america like you know just like he's just no, a working class dude doing his job like you know i mean i don't know if he's but like, it's like it also class, you know he also I mean. becomes the representative of like the person who is just going on with their life when when an act of terror happens and who has to just kind of soldier on and so to me that was an interesting story i guess i would have liked it better if they didn't like put the button on it of like 
at the end, they really like are just like, did you guys notice? He literally says died? like, I was just, it's a living. Yeah. Like, like it's was, literally think, that moment. I think that yeah. was the point where I was like, oh God, like you couldn't just like let it be like, you couldn't let that performance yeah. and that character be. And I feel like this whole movie feels so much like that's the other thing is that it does is that it keeps being like, huh? huh? Did you guys, did you guys understand that? Here, let me dumb it down <laughs> Do you for think you it and like, was... spell it out even more explicitly in case you still didn't get it. Do you think the tone and all the things we've been complaining about are because they were nervous that in the wake of things like what happened where that that anchor person was killed by a guy who came up on television and all that? Do you think in the wake of that, they were like, we have to make this lighter and we have to distance it and we have to do something. It can't be this intense. Is that I wouldn't be surprised. Or? I wouldn't be surprised if that came into play, especially if they were doing some sort of, you know, reshooting where it changed the end of the movie. For all I know, maybe it was something a little grimmer at the end. And, you know, maybe this is part of the reason that I did enjoy it is because there is a major disconnect between this movie and what is really happening today. But mm-hmm. backtracking a little, the worst two performances in this movie, I couldn't stand Dominic West. Like, he is just, like, a step away from being, like, a mustache mustache twirling oh, villain. Oh, yeah. one mustache away from <laughs> but, being a mustache twirling villain, yes. But yeah. the absolute worst, and it drove me nuts the entire movie, is Giancarlo Esposito as the head of the police. The police in this movie, worst representation of the NYPD I have ever seen in my life. That's pretty they are They are all the dumbest cops. At, like, I don't know they, they what he was doing the incompetent. entire movie. Oh, so bad. And just like the way the way that they like used and not all in the way stuff that it feels they... like they're trying to make a point. It just feels like it's like because they're movie cops. They also oh, they, have very little to do. Like you're like you understand yeah. why they ha- this movie has to have cops because you can't have a movie about an active hostage situation in New York and have no cop characters, but like they give they have so little to do that it does kind of feel like, "Well, why did we even bother?" They also admit that they have so little to do or don't know what to do Repeatedly. so often. And then finally they do do something and it's the dumbest something ever. That would like in a real life situation never work out the way they needed it to oh, work yeah, out and every like plan that they come up with for how they're gonna like solve this is just like you're just like that is a terrible idea and like they're telling each other it's a terrible idea but then they're all like yeah we're gonna do it anyway like, it happens. everyone yeah, in this yeah. movie is just such a cookie cutter version of you know what their job description is between Completely. you know george Cl- george clooney eating up the spotlight and doing his stupid dances jack o'connell try- just trying to make a living and working hard so he can make some money for for his family and like the stupid cop and even down to uh pat uh, julia roberts's character's assistants like they are such you know uh like TV industry PA type people who are just like sent on errands. I feel like I feel like when I was watching this, especially the way that they treat like Lenny the cameraman and like Jack O'Connell's characters and like that like that class of people, like not the kind of really well off people, in the, but the people like below that. Like it kind of made me be like, Jodie Foster hasn't talked to a normal person in like a really long time, has she? Yeah, the, the whole movie feels out of touch. I said to someone after the movie, well, it feels just, like it could have been made twenty years ago. Jodie and Foster didn't that. work on this script though. Just, I mean, not that that she she directed the movie, so she's guilty as anyone. But she she didn't work on the script at all, so it's, just, I, it's a shame. I like some of Jodie Foster's stuff. I think Home for the I Holidays. Like I think that's Bieber. why I'm disappointed. The movie Home for the fun. Holidays is about a family, and it feels like a real family. This no one feels like a real person. They all feel like like I heard about a, a person like this one time or something. It, it all feels so sketchy, and we spend so much time. This movie is so long for us to feel so sketchy. You know what? Okay, we should wrap up. But do you know what the Jack O'Connell character feels like that I just realized is like you know when politicians go on and like do their stump speeches and they're like I met a man from Wisconsin who told me like blah 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 and then they tell this like like pro- like almost certainly completely made up story about like some like ordinary American who's yeah. having a hard time. That is what that Jack O'Connell character is. A little more violent, but basically that's what he feels like. He feels like a made up person in a politician stump st- stump speech. Yeah. Yeah, he does. I, I completely right. agree. So, so where so do we, we want to wrap monster? up? Do you want you guys want to go first so we can end this with a little bit of a positive note? Uh I I just don't I don't I think this is just sub par. I think there's a lot more fun things out right now. I'd skip it. Yeah, it's I'm not going to be like everyone runs screaming from this movie as if it were a ticking time bomb, but I just don't really see the point. <laughs> Whoa. That's the ultimate pull quote. There's like damning it with faint praise and then there's whatever the fuck that was. <laughs> <laughs> I said it wasn't a ticking time bomb, guys. I think this movie has gotten to your head a little bit. I, I was trying to be thematic, and you guys just, like, completely are, like, not appreciating it. I need to, I need to have a better class of podcast co-host. I mean, come on. Appreciate my wordplay. All right, you need so, to ask your murder bot for a better metaphor. Yeah, really. 
<laughs> no one knows what we're talking about right now. Angie owns a murder bot. Um, it's so I'm Amazon not. Amazon <laughs> Echo. It's a normal thing. Lots of people own. Sorry, go on. <laughs> I'm not going to defend the quality of this movie. I know it is subpar in many, many ways, but. I'm going to say, do not run to see it in theaters, but when this thing comes out on, you know, Netflix, DVD, if it's rain, a rainy day, I think this is the perfect thing to kind of just chill and watch. Do do a double feature with The Call. It'll be a really exhilarating afternoon for you. By the time this <laughs> is on Netflix, Love and Friendship is going to be on Amazon, so just watch that instead. Yeah, huh? I'm with Andrea on that. All right, I can't, I can't knock you on that one because I haven't seen it yet. Um, all right, so that is a wrap on episode 114 of Popcorn and Prosecco. You know where to go. iTunes, where you can subscribe and comment and rate the podcast. Then please go to our website, popcornprosecco.com. You can like us on Facebook. We are also on Twitter, at Popcorn and Prosecco. And then all three of us are on the internet as well. Christy, do you want to go first? Sure. You can find me on Twitter, at Christy Puchko. Uh, that's K-R-I-S-D-Y-P-U-C-H-K-O. And I write all over the interweb, but you can find career highlights at decadentcriminals.com. Angie? Um, you can find me on Twitter at A-J-H-A-N, and I am at slashfilm.com. And you can catch me on collider.com and the Collider Video YouTube channel, and my Twitter handle is P. Nemeroff. So thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you next week. It's a James Martin. Vastly rich, rather simple. How jolly. Tiny green balls. What are they called? Peas. <laughs> <laughs>